Joe presents Pioneers, together with Open Money. Financial advice for all. Hello and welcome to Pioneers. My guest this week is Holly Tucker, who founded Europe's biggest small business marketplace, the GIF website, notinthehighstreet.com. With annual turnover north of 150 million and sellers contributing almost 600 million gross value added to the UK economy, it's no surprise she was awarded an MBE for services to enterprise and is now a UK ambassador to creative small businesses. Welcome, Holly. You're, you're quite similar to, to a previous guest of ours, Cassandra Stavro, who founded Propercorn, in that you, I mean, you've talked about this released into life. She had a real entrepreneurial spirit at a very young age, and, and you did too, I think. Yes, absolutely, yeah. I, I, you know, I remember building companies at home, be it a travel agent where I'd gone and got all the brochures for free out of travel agencies and I make my parents book tickets with me and I take them through the whole process and they give me real money, be it my pocket money that I would double through my mum if I cleaned her room, not mine, not just my own, uh, you know, family holidays where I would set up a little nail bar, massage parlour and it would be two pounds per everything I uh, the first tuck shop in my school um, I created so yes I've always um, had a little book by my side where I would scribble down um, that new business idea Mm -hmm. so even I think it was before this time even before you you did the tuck shop you had a a novel way of of finding money that involves getting your hands a little Oh, my dirty. goodness. I can't believe that you know about that. Mm. I really regret saying that ever, but here <laughs> we go again. Yes, no, I would... I would. Um, I don't understand, guys. Um, you, you, I, I, I'm not saying you, but Of men, course, not all men. <laughs> not all men. But and I'm sure it's changed as well, but um, men seem to empty their pockets of change in the urinals. Nothing has changed. Uh, but why? I don't believe it's intentional. So what were you? Oh, I, I see. Uh, oh, is it, I, I hope, I've never even thought really about having, this. I can't are even. Are you co- having your ha moment? I'm right having a ha moment. I can't even believe I it's am about so this. So pleased I've been able to facilitate okay, this. Okay, well, I'm really glad because I hadn't even thought about. Did that. you think that people were just sidling up to Literally. the urinal and then tossing their coins yes. in as if to make a wish? Yes, I don't. I, yeah, well, I didn't know. Understand why? But men are quite strange, so I didn't think anything of it. But now thinking about it, okay. So what I would do is put on the marigolds because I was cleaning the loos and and the bathrooms already. And I might have, you know, taken the change and washed it and, you know, put it in disinfectant and, you know, earned a few more pounds. You were um, a, a urinal miner. I was, <laughs> I, I was um, yes, I was an opportunist. Here's a question for you. What, what grade did you get in your A-level business? Um, a D. I got a D, Mr Perkins. Yes, he, he um, yeah, but, you know, it's... It's such a pity, and it's one of the things I'm passionate about. The way we're educating has not, it didn't inspire me enough. I would be given a textbook, and each class was asked to, he would write what was in the textbook on the whiteboard, and Mm. then we would repeat it into my book. That rote learning from the the 1900s, really, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And that was the way I was being taught business. And the point is, is that I don't learn that way. And I wish I had learnt in a way that I'm teaching my son at the moment, where it's all about his right side of the brain. He loves business, but we're tackling it in a way that his brain can absorb it. And so we're dealing with P&Ls and cash flows at the moment. He's 13. But we we talk about it in a completely different way. I bring it to life. It's real. And he's just a sponge at the moment. And and that's amazing when you think about it, because I think a lot of people would think, even as business people, mature business people, they find tackling the P&L, the, the, the finance side of business, daunting enough. But being able to distill it to a point where you can explain it to a 13-year-old. Yeah, but that's the point. We've got to do that now. And um, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about my second business, Holly & Co., but one of my missions there is going to be bringing colour to the grey world of business. Mm-hmm. I want to start to, if there was one Bible or the gospel you know, book on business. I want to rewrite it for small business because Mm -hmm. I think we're not allowing some of the most incredible people to live their dreams because of that imposter syndrome that has been installed in us because we believe that big business knows better or we've heard it when we were children or whatever that is. And I do believe that actually business is so exciting. It's completely colourful. It is what you want to make it, but there's going to be a lot of people who 
will make sure that you believe that it's very, very scary mm -hmm. and that it's a black art. You know, you can't get into it. You know, it's like, you know, you've not what you've not gone and studied business at business school. Well, you've got no hope. I mean, I would say, actually, maybe that person who joined the workforce at 16 has a far better idea of what it takes to... I mean, you talk about business school. You did well in other subjects outside of uh, Mr. Yeah. Perkins' D. Yeah. yeah. You did well in other but you decided university wasn't for you. I got a place at... Um, I don't know if I actually got a place, but my foundation um, portfolio for art was good enough to go straight to uni. Um, I could skip that process because of my... Um, my t talent in creativity anyway but because I had been in a hurry um, I had spent the last three summers before my A-level results working um, my uncle's best friend uh, ran a company called Publicist Advertising Agency mm -hmm. in London Baker Street and I decided not to go and sit in the fields and um, you know try my first beers and things like that um, I went to work so I worked for three summers um, as their Crikey knows what you would call me, the junior, junior, mm -hmm. tea maker, it, you know. Just getting your feet wet, getting in there. Absolutely getting in there. Mm -hmm. And then the day that um, I got my A-level results, that morning I got an interview uh, with um, uh, Rick Bendel. And um, he was the top, top boss. And I went in there saying, you know, I'm going to get my A-level results this afternoon. Mum's around the corner in the car waiting with my little sister in the back. We're going to go and get them. I don't know what I've got, but I'm thinking I might like to do my University of Life here rather than going to uni um, and I'm wondering and and he gave me the job that morning and so I went and collected my A-level results um, where I got two A's and a D and um, and decided no that that I think that my heart that ability to want to seize life or that that speed that I was at or I don't mm. know what it was life told me to go and um, go to the University of Life were the ideas I mean you're about to commit to the ad agency were the ideas already percolating in your head at that point the ones that you'd had previously about whether it was urinal mining or yeah. or tuck shops or something I've else were say, the new ideas no I think I, I've got to say that whole entrepreneurial side really calmed down because, of course, now looking back, that steep learning curve I was on, you know, I was celebrating my 18th birthday in an office dealing with clients such as L'Oreal, Renault. Mm -hmm. um, I was under, I was the junior junior, but that meant one pitch days, I was the one there at 2 a.m. and at 6 a.m. the next day. Yep. Um, I had a one and a half hour commute there, a one and a half hour commute back, um, and it was tough you know and I was earning I think about 12,000 pounds a year I was living at home um but you know traveling and everything so it was hard and all my friends went to uni so I was in the workplace I was the only one in the workplace um and so it was a I definitely all of those sort of thoughts of me being my own boss left um and really I only revisited that um, once I um, finished my career in publishing a few years on um, due to different circumstances. And then you went off, you, that was when you went off to Brides Magazine and then to the yeah. wedding startup, I think. Yeah, so I went from advertising, I went then to Condé Nast in publishing. Um, I brought a heap of, I mean, I was 20 um, and I had been dealing with big, big stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I was one of the youngest account managers in London at the time with big responsibilities and big budgets and things. And so I went into publishing where I love the art of selling and selling space and working and creating new ideas for publishing. And it was in the days where publishing was thriving. And, yep. you know, Vogue House was an amazing place to be. I wasn't one of those people, though. Um, and I got headhunted in the dot-com boom um, to a wedding startup who was online. Um, and it was really, really interesting. I was very, very interested in taking, you know, that new medium, that new medium, what that was going to be. Um, but it didn't last too long. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, it was it was an amazing experience to go from advertising into magazines into web. So when did the idea of Chiswick's first Christmas fair come from? Because I think that... that when I, when I look at your bio, it seems like that's the first kind of real life incarnation of not in the high street. It, it, it was, yeah. It, yeah. it was the physical tiny town hall, not on the high street in mm -hmm. a way. Um, it started when I um, came out of um, a bad relationship. Um, 
getting divorced very young at 23 years old and um, having a brain tumour and just life was not good. So I was suffering the consequences of maybe being so much in a hurry. Yeah. Hurry, hurry, hurry. So I took that moment to stop and I needed to get connect with my creative self. So what I did is then look at um, being creative. So at, at home, um, I started creating floral um, different displays and it became a wreath, a Christmas wreath. And that Christmas wreath needed to be sold. And so I decided that um, I'd sell it at the Christmas fair and the Christmas fair wasn't there. So at this point in time, I was freelancing and publishing. So I thought, well, if I create the fair, then I could have the best table. And that is where the first Chiswick Christmas Fair came along, where I got the best trestle table. I had also put another 90 companies into that town hall, selected them, hand selected them, and saw the magic and what actually happens mm -hmm. when you curate amazing companies together under one roof. And so I um, sold the wreaths, uh, was over wreaths in a day. Like, that was definitely not going to be my company, like the bins. <laughs> I was not going to bins and wreaths. Thank goodness that left me. Um, and then I created a company called Your Local Fair, which was the local fairs um, that I would put on and I would curate these amazing small businesses. Mm -hmm. And this was going to make me a fortune, um, but it didn't. Uh, but, I mean, it, we'll, we'll talk about that for sure. Mm. I, I just think it's... A, there's a thing here where you've got an illness, you, 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 you're dealing with a relationship breakup. And, and so many people might think the logic of I'm going to create something in my house, that makes sense to them. But what you did is so much more than that. I mean, what is, what is the mindset that drives you not just to say, right, I'm going to create this, but now I need to sell it. And, and then there's nothing to sell it with, so now I need to create the format for it to be sold in. And and now while I'm doing this, I might as well curate 90 other businesses to come together and deliver this. It's it's quite remarkable when you think about it that way. I like to, um, I'm sort of doing something similar in my life at the moment. Because I have a vision and I can see it and I'm in it, then when I sit down and I'm in the reality of it's not actually real, for me, I've already got the path to make it real, all I just have to do is just do it. And so the just doing bit mm -hmm. just is a practicality and uh, and I can execute. So I find that sometimes I meet people who have great ideas and they find execution really hard. Um, I can execute. And so not that I realize this, now I look back and I understand that that yin, of yang, yin and yang is a great thing. Um, which has allowed me to create businesses. But th at that point in time, it was just, just do it. Well, then that's the easy bit, isn't it? You, you, the visualising and the model and the working it all out is the hard bit. The just doing it is just, um, you know, how many hours can you stay up and organise people? Yeah, I mean, I think you might make it sound a little easier than it is. I mean, the visualisation, I, I totally get that. But I'm trying to think of how you go about setting up the Christmas fair, it, it, it's not that it's it's um, esoteric, but it, it's so time intensive, labor intensive. There must have been so many elements that you had no specific no experience in. Oh, not no a clue. clue. No clue in all of it. I had no clue in all of it, but I could see it. So let, it's not rocket science. You know, I needed to get a building. I've never hired a town hall before in my life. And, you know, I've got to market it. I've never marketed anything. I've got to get public into a place. I've never done that. I've, I've got to speak to small businesses. Well, how do I even contact them? They've got to have media packs because I came from a world of advertising where you treat your clients and prospective clients well. Well, these were only hiring trestle tables, but they had a whole media pack because that's how... Uh, brand should be mm -hmm. nothing it doesn't daunt it wasn't daunting for me and gosh you know was it hard work I mean I'm but hard work is my uh, another currency of mine it's just a lot of sweat you know my none of my grades ever came because I was um you know uh, very clever it was sweat and blood and tears and so maybe that's just what i thought was normal so so it was normal to me to do this it was incredibly difficult it was morning on my big brick phone 
lunchtime sitting on, I was working at Piccadilly, I'd sit outside the theatres on my brick phone and it was evening up until one, go to work and do it again. Work all weekend. Weekends were a blessing. You know, you had 48 hours that you could work. It was incredible. So, but yeah, so I had that vision and I just needed to see it happen. And then once you see it happen, you see the problem is, is that you see that happen. You go, oh, OK, now I get it. I now need to see the next thing happen. Mm -hmm. And it just keeps on going. Sounds like an addiction almost. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. I mean, you talked about trestle tables. I'm assuming you know your way around those pretty well right now. I do indeed. Yes, I do. I, I know trestle tables very well. I know um, kitchen tables very well. I know lots of tables very well. <laughs> so the first night after your runaway success, I'm assuming, with your... Chiswick Fair. Yeah. What then? What was the, what were the thoughts that sparked in your mind? I've got to make about a million wreaths and get them out the door, and I never want to see another wreath again. <laughs> so I did that. Um, then the next step was tell my dad I'm going to quit freelance world of publishing, and I am going to set up a company that designs fairs. And um, I needed to leave the world of um, being well paid and freelancing. I had a mortgage um, at a very young age. Um, I think I got my mortgage at 19 or 20. Wow. Um, and so, um, you know, I had resp proper responsibilities. Mm -hmm. um, I had been lucky enough to meet my life partner, Frank. Um, we just celebrated 16 years together. And he... He was an angel from above. I was a very broken woman when he met me and he allowed me to um, re-believe in myself. Um, Holly Hurricane was a good thing to him. And so, you know, I, I, I built your local fair. Um, and I don't think I would have been able to do it, obviously, without the support of people wanting me to heal, you know, and they saw that this was a good thing for me. They saw the smile, the brightness in my eyes again. And this was a good thing for everyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned you have an interesting relationship with tables, trestles and kitchen tables. It was around your kitchen table you hashed out yeah. the idea of not, not on high, high street. street. Yeah, absolutely. It was, um, I sent an email to my ex-boss, Sophie, at Publicis. And I, um, Harry was, yeah, two and a half, three months old. And I said, you know, I need to bring everything that's not on the high street under a, now, a new town hall roof called the internet. And these small businesses I've worked with for two years, they need someone and we need to do this. Um, you don't happen to be interested, do you? And 24 hours later, she said, I'm in. And I think a week later, we That's then amazing. met, we met around a, one of our kitchen tables and just started. It, it must have been an amazingly compelling email to get across your passion, that level of detail, a faith in your confidence that it can work out. I think um, she knew me. We always talked about how our um, we weren't friends, we were work colleagues. So I knew she was the yin to my yang, and I think she knew I was it, and we highly respected each other. And so even though there was an age difference of about 10 years, there was, um, we knew that we, together, we were great. And, um, I think why it was compelling is it was just at the time where there were four Starbucks on one high street, all of the small businesses going under. We were the we were the consumer ourselves, so we knew that we were looking at the backs of magazines for that little website because that was the hard to find um, thing that makes women go absolutely mental to shop with, um, and so we knew that there wasn't such a thing out there. And so when I think, and she's a smart cookie, she saw that, and we just knew, well, if we could do it, that, that um, a lot of our friends would shop on it and we would shop on it. So maybe probably there's a lot of us. Um, but yeah, it was a big moment. You're watching Pioneers, together with Open Money. I think one of the things that's fascinating about this is that you're hovering on the brink of the, uh, of the recession as you were trying to mm. pull this all together. And there's this brilliant quote you've got saying, two blondes going around the city talking about their little shopping website. You must have had some desperate times. I mean, we know the world is not quite as evolved as we wish it were. And certainly when you were doing this, less so. I mean, what was that experience like going around trying it to was, get it was It was heartbreaking, heartbreaking. I'd never, I, I say never repeat again, I'm repeating it. Um, it, it, it was heartbreaking. We, um, 
I think I was just speaking to someone where I st- I think still 2.6% of money raised is through women mm-hmm. at the moment. Yep. So if we now then take that, that's today in 2018. So let's go back to 2006 and think how many women were raising money. Yeah. I mean, near nothing, no one. Yep. Um, so actually when the, and you've got to remember the landscape, no smartphone, no social, uh, people were joining not on the high street asking if they needed to have the internet or a computer, uh, not on the high street dot com. That yes, you do. Yes, yes you do. Um, <laughs> and um, that it was a complete. It's actually how crazy. Almost a decade. We just don't even understand this. Mm-hmm. The only marketplaces were Amazon and eBay. Uh, craft was a bad word. Uh, there wasn't such a thing as you wouldn't even say the word marketplace, let alone entrepreneur. You didn't raise money through your friends and and family. You raised money through the bank or through venture capital. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very, very different world. And, you know, we were, to cut a long story short, you know, ultimately writing checks on our credit card checkbooks for staff. We weren't being paid. Uh, We had young families. Our husbands didn't earn a lot of money. Uh, We had very little money. We were burning it very, very quickly. We didn't realize what we were trying to build was a single basket with multiple sellers. eBay had just launched it in America. I naively picked up the phone to see what, what, I don't know what I thought I was going to, can I buy that from you, eBay? It, it It was crazy times because we weren't tech. We weren't retail. We were two women who understand what we were going to do and we had to find a way around it. And it's what I look at as my maternal instinct and her maternal instinct to this business, um, which was, would I ever, ever let a child suffer? No. Would I ever not bring it life? No. So that's what we were going to do with Not On The High Street. So despite all that, you never considered all the challenges, you never considered checking it in just saying never never ever ever and i think it's that loyalty and visualization and mm-hmm. absolute commitment that so even at that stage when i think that you, you were having trouble paying your heating bills right yeah oh yeah no we were we were we were dead basically we so were dead even at that stage so the we were visualization dead. drove we, you yeah we were dead and um, my father i remember sitting on a train who was um a financial director um, in the corporate world, and so he could bring such um, seniority to our financial planning. And at, even at that point, we had two months of any money, um, and that was already on the back of loans, et cetera, et cetera. And then it was going to be, you're going to have to sell your house yep. because you're going to be in debt. And um, it was the darkest of days it was the darkest darkest of days and Sophie and I would take ourselves into the crappy sort of communal stationary cupboard lock the door and absolutely hyena cry because we were about to lose Mm. our felt like a child we were about to lose everything that we had not been with our children it's very Aaron Brockovich you know we had not been with our children. We, you know, my son was three months old. I hadn't seen his first steps, listened to his first words. I hadn't been home for any weekends. And yet I wanted to be a mother. And so it was incredibly personal. And so, you know, but but yet at that very time that we were trying to raise that first money, we were making sales because it was Christmas Mm -hmm. and the model was working and it was horrible, horrible that the universe did that to us. To juxtapose such hardship with the idea this could work. But we we had run out of time. So so how did you raise that first money? We Um, You you mentioned the loans and everything else. but Yeah, we went around um, the city. An investor, you know, either wouldn't be interested and some gave us names of people that might be. Um, many, many guys would tell us that their wives did the shopping and good luck with our craft business. <laughs> Nothing um, patronising about no, that. Uh, I mean, you know, yeah. <clears throat> I just, uh, and that's, I won't go into really the big stories on this, but it was, it was an oh, amazing... Oh, please, come on. No, no, oh. <laughs> I mean, I won't, because it's just, it was just appalling, absolutely appalling. And 
we got to the point where, you know, the 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 bank wouldn't help us. Um, no one could see what we were doing. Although we were giving smart presentations out, these were, but they just couldn't view it past what they were actually seeing. And um, it was um, someone who has been working with us doing our PR um, for equity um, was sitting in a church in the south of France and she turned around on a pew and she said to a guy that she knew and they were just chatting, she said, you know, you don't happen to know I'm working with this company called Not on the High Street you don't happen to know anybody do you who would help them they're looking to raise money and it's a he said you know what I do I know this guy called Tom Tightman he's just written the first check to lastminute.com I think they should meet and she walked out the church called me I called Sophie and I think within a week we'd met Tom within two months we had done a number of presentations um, and this was in the December so the mm -hmm. sales were coming in um, we didn't have a first year of accounts we didn't have any of those things but we were highly professional we were professional women so we he could see that and in the um, just before Christmas he um, we let we did the presentation we were leaving the room my father patted Sophie and I on the back and said, you did your best, guys. Put on our coats for us. I mean, we were basically in tears. We knew we hadn't done it. And we were standing at the lift with our bags full of the personalised dinosaur T-shirts and everything. Anyway, Tom came in and he said, do you have a second? And uh, the, the fund was called Spark Ventures. And he said, just to let you know, um, you've got the spark. Um, we're going to do the deal. And February the 14th, uh, 2007, we took our first money. And if it wasn't for him understanding that investing in people, people is the number one thing that, you know, is going to make something work. They, he knew we were never going to let this business die. And so he invested in us and, and so he saved our lives. So, but you mentioned already the other story of your launch. Yeah. So what happened there? You, I think, yeah. calling it a disaster. Or? Yeah, I mean, it was the biggest balls up, really. <laughs> it was. It was the fact that, um, you know, we weren't tech. Yeah. So we didn't know this word called beta. You know, what is that whole oh, thing? Yes. You know, why try something out before you launch yeah, it? Yeah. Why no? So what you should do is. Um, because, you know, we, we, we understood publishing and we understood um, press and we understood um, getting our amplification out there. So what we need to do is a bit of a teaser. So we created a microsite. And what we did is did a 50 day countdown. So every day we'd go 50, 49, 48, and it would have a present and the present would just unwrap and show a unique product. And I think there was about four products. Pop your email address in there if you'd like to know more. And so... 50 days, we were in no state to be doing this, but we had to because of um, because of money was running out, yep. right? And so th mm -hmm. this was happening. We'd got some small, tiny business in God knows where who had promised that they could build this site. Um, and we had no idea really what we were building in sense that no one else had this technology. They said they can do it. We trusted them. We did a few meetings and we were thorough. You know, we're not, you know, we're not, you know, we weren't playing at this. But with everything else that we were doing, mm -hmm. onboarding all of these businesses, all of these products, building a team, understanding how to build a marketplace, understanding that you had to sell the Internet to start with mm -hmm. and then sell the whole thing meant that on uh, day four on that microsite, Things were pretty heated. Um, we were told that, unfortunately, they weren't going to be able to launch with a checkout. Oops. That little thing of building a retail business that we actually um, we had secured, I think, the Daily Mail, the um, Daily mm -hmm. Candy. With the, we were the business on Daily Candy, Daily Mail, the Express, and something else. And this was all secured, and in four days' time, and there was going to be no checkout. So, and I actually think it might have been 48 hours before. It was horrific. And so we had to think on our feet. We decided to send the email out, called the preview, the press preview, you know, the preview to our VIPs. 16,000 unique users came on the blinking website that day oh. and they couldn't buy anything. What was their reaction? Oh, loved it. Absolutely loved it. Um, completely loved it, but wished they could buy something on our shop. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love your shop. I wish I could buy something there. I was like, don't be so ridiculous, you know. Really? Yeah. Just come yeah. and look. It's yeah. beautiful. It's a great shop window. 
When you um, made your first billion, what was that feeling like? Especially, you know, given the juxtaposition with that hardship, what was that like? Yeah, um, I've always been motivated by money. Um, taking the pounds out of the urinals, right? Do you know what I mean? why was I doing that? Money gave me opportunity, and um, and so I was very much. Um, I always just wanted to bank the fact that maybe I was going to be able to continue living this life, mm -hmm. not living the life in terms of material, but living this life where I could control my own destiny. Yeah. And could I continue to build a world where I could give and help people? In order to do that, I needed to just sort out some practicalities, which was m us eating as a family. Um, my husband gave up his career in... Um, the police after 28 years and in a Scotland Yard. He was a detective for counterterrorism. And mm -hmm. and so actually we had risked a lot, right? He was, um, I think Harry was about three years old when we made this decision. So I was the sole breadwinner in, the, in, the, in our home and we weren't from money. So everything rested on that. So, so it I, must have felt fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I don't know when I actually, actually looked at a... Um, you know, it doesn't just happen that you just get a million pounds. No. but in roundabout ways of renovating a house or from doing this to doing that, there was a moment where that then started to become my world. But you've also got to remember, you know, in our worlds, a million pounds is not what it used to be 20 years ago, right? Also so true. it's, and I'm, I'm not downplaying that, but, you know, I'm, what I'm very proud of is now at Not in the High Street, there is 20 million pound businesses a year see that that's something else i think from your entire narrative what you're talking about is this commitment not just to your baby your business but to the idea of helping facilitate other businesses grow so that must almost have been perhaps not quite but almost have been as good a feeling for you to know that these other businesses out there that perhaps would have had no shop front no visibility suddenly are finding themselves well i didn't booming. i as much as money motivates me i didn't do it for the money mm -hmm. You always have those moments, don't you? Of course, you know, the hardships and, and everything like that. And just if I didn't have to worry about the mortgage being paid this year, that would just be amazing. But actually didn't do it for the money. When I see what we have been able to do and change an entire community, this hidden army that was there, and we shone a light on it, you know, and I think about, you know, over the 12 years, 600 million has been pumped into this hidden community. Yep. It is an incredible thing because we have absolutely changed the not only the lives of the maybe the woman who started it, the husband's quit his job and joined. Those kids are going to a different school. That holiday has actually been able to be had. They'd never left the country before. Um, dreams have come true. Mm -hmm. um, they are controlling their own destiny. Now, do they have to work to the point of, you know, no return? Of course they do. This isn't an easy thing, I'm saying. But it's been the most privileged position to sit as a bird's eye point of view and watch thousands, you know, 5,000 businesses, 250,000 products, and watch this happen and watch people going through my journey, mine and Sophie's journey. Mm -hmm. They're now doing it. So they are doing the million pounds a year. We've got about five businesses doing two million pounds a year. This is incredible. So that for me is actually a far bigger motivator in my life. So is that motivation perhaps the, the motivation behind Holly & Co starting that? You thought that your experiences are so relatable that mm -hmm. that, 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 that insight could be... I didn't actually, I said never again because of everything I've just described. Um, also, my husband's, you know, my partner's very tired. My son is 13 now. Mm -hmm. um, the point is, is I think that maybe with the 29,000 days on this planet, you know, we all have a, um, some of us feel responsibility to use that time to whatever your calling is. And I think that I had the 15 years of very, very unique experience. I had gone from making vegetable wreaths as a small business, creative business, to your local fair, to not on the high street. And I said, well, is that the end of the journey? 
And if you think how maybe Jamie Oliver has changed the food industry, if you Mm. think how 20 years ago we start talking about family meals and health and we think about the supply chain between a a supermarket and the farmers, you think about turkey Twizzlers Mm -hmm. or the sugar thing. Oh, yeah. Who is doing that sort of pipe piper sort of role in this small business community? Nobody. And so if you put that together, I feel it's my obligation to help people um, to be vulnerable, to be truthful, to always be honest, and to help them find a path to either living that dream that they've always had, Mm -hmm. to quitting that job that they've never liked, or to help mentor them through what is a roller coaster when you have your own business. Mm -hmm. And I... If I can be the cheerleader of this group of people, um, when only we only know that, you know, with the freelance economy, you know, 40 percent of the workforce will be freelance by 2020. This is not this is not just a fad or an era. It's not change. a minority group that you're no, it's working growing, with. Yes. you know, and it's mm-hmm. amazing that not the high street can enter a second decade, one which was the high street declining and the second decade being the sharing economy. Yeah. And I think that's a very unique thing for not the high street. But for Holly and Co., It's that sort of the peripheral, it's the vision of what this is for everyone. Can I now, a little bit like the the analogy of the the wreath and the trestle table Mm -hmm. and then creating the fair to sell the wreath, can I now create lots of opportunities and different platforms for these small businesses and then that helps them in return. Yep. And so, but I have to build them all first, you know. So, uh, you know, no, that, that's... Uh, no, nothing, nothing challenging there. No. Just build them all first. <laughs> well, let's learn more more about the real Holly Tucker. We've talked about business for almost an hour, but we have some uh, quick fire pop quiz questions oh, that no. I think... Um, okay. So these are, these are quick fire. They usually end up not being quite so. But what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Uh, teaching. Uh, that absolutely makes sense. Which business or company, apart from your own, do you wish you'd founded? Um, oh, gosh. Mm. <laughs> That's a difficult one. Um, there's, I, I don't know if there's just one. I, I love the businesses that have come across um, commercializing doing good. So um, the dots, um, which is a market, a, a marketplace for professionals who want to work in the freelancing world from graphic designers to copywriters. Um, and um, that's an amazing, amazing business. Another one of those curations type. Yeah, I, uh, maybe. Yeah, I think it's anything that actually has curation and where that founder has those eyeballs that are special eyeballs. That so they see. They, they, they see. see right? They yeah, see. So you. sorry, not one. No, no, that's fine. That's that's good. You can have the whole category. Oh, um, good. <laughs> uh, who's your hero? Uh, my hero is my sister. Um, she was a number three employee. She was actually uh, at university. She came to look after Harry. And she was the one that made me email Sophie. Ah. She then was employee number three. It was only meant to be a temporary three-month job. Uh, she was there um, for a decade with me. If I'm Alan Sugar, she's my Margaret. Oh, lovely. And uh, she's the co-founder of Holly & Co. And um, she's my soul sister, my Margaret, um, and a very, very special person to me. Thank you. What's your favourite word? Fuck. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, what's your least favourite word? I don't have a word, but damn it, I can't stand it when people say it is what it is. I'll take that. That's all right. That's good. Uh, what's your hmm, What's your biggest fault? Um, sometimes being too optimistic. Sometimes. Yeah, I think people would listen to this podcast <laughs> and think perhaps not sometimes. Um, I love that being optimistic is a fault in your world. That's uh, good. Okay. Oh, no, but is that one of those answers that's ever like, oh, God, that's one of those answers. That's not really a fault. It's all right. It's but, too late. It's uh, happened. Sorry, it's sorry, happened. Sorry, it's sorry. happened and time moves on. <laughs> uh, what's your idea of happiness? Uh, watching um, the mission that we're on bringing utter joy to those who work for me. I've got an amazing team at Holly & Co. um, And I think it's changing their lives personally. And then obviously watching the small businesses that we help and changing their lives. Mm -hmm. That is just utter bliss for me. What keeps you awake at night? 
Not that you sleep at all with your schedule, but... Um, what keeps me awake? Mm -hmm. uh, when I think people are unhappy. What's your favourite swear word? I think we may have experienced it. Oh, God, no, you haven't. Oh, really? Um, no, oh, but, please. No, but, no, no, but we're can, not going to... No, please, but... please know <laughs> that you can say it. <laughs> Oh, I've got the, so many. The anticipation is killing me. <laughs> I mean, fuck face is a great one. OK. Um, I sometimes say that a lot. Um, but, yeah, no, actually, I've, I have slight Tourette, so the, the, the whole lot of them is pretty good to me. OK, good. A good selection we have yeah. there. Uh, <laughs> if heaven exists, what would you like God to say when you arrive? Oh, then you can't ask me that because I'm going <laughs> to get emotional. Um, um, thank you for helping so many people. Thank you. That's it for Pioneers. My thanks to Holly Tucker. Thank you. Don't forget you can download previous episodes of the show and all of Joe's audio offerings from your usual podcast providers. Leave us a review if you'd be so kind, and we will speak to you next week. You've been watching Pioneers, together with Open Money. Manage it, save it, invest it.